structure of the sarcomere. That's pretty much what we left off with. Um, what, <coughs> what was the, um, the banding pattern? Okay, what was the dark band? Do you remember what it's called? What? Was it really the Actin. Oh, actin is in the sarcomere, right? Actin is the thin filament, and myosin is the thick filament. But I'm asking, what is the dark band called? The A band. And what does it consist of in the middle? Myosin. And on the outer edges, it consists of actin and myosin overlapping. And that's the reason why it's dark color, because it's pretty dense. Um, so that's the dark band. In the center of the A band, what do we have? A lighter area. Hmm? The H zone, right? The H zone. And um, the H zone, again, is a little lighter because it's just myosin that's found there. And then we have an I band, which is very light. And what does it contain? Just the actin, right? And it actually traverses two sarcomeres and has a little Z disc in the middle of it. Okay, so we talked a little bit about that. When a when a sarcomere shortens, does actin and myosin get shorter? Yes or no? Do actin and myosin get shorter when a sarcomere shortens? No. No, they stay the same length, but the sarcomere itself does shorten. Exactly. Um, okay, so when the sarcomere shortens, what happens to the H zone? It disappears, right? Because the actin and myosin overlap now in the middle, and you lose the H zone. Additionally, what happens to the A bands? These guys are going to move closer together, but the width is going to stay the same. Why does it stay the same? Because the A band basically is delineated here by our myosin, and that is going to stay the same length. Additionally, our Z discs move closer together, and um, that's pretty much it. Um, then we talked a little bit about, okay, so we talked about the structure of the sarcomere. Now let's talk about the physiology of how a skeletal muscle actually contracts. And remember we said that at the neuromuscular junction, we have an axon terminal and we have a motor end plate of the skeletal muscle. And in the middle, we have a cleft, a space, just like we did um, when we looked at a synapse for a neuron binding to some other type of effector. Same three parts. Um, so what happens when we get to the axon terminal, um, which neurotransmitter is released from a motor neuron? Acetylcholine, exactly. And acetylcholine binds to nicotinic receptors because when acetylcholine binds to skeletal muscle cell, it produces an EPSP every time. So when acetylcholine binds to nicotinic receptor, that's gonna cause um, basically, uh, it causes the muscle cell to the membrane to reach threshold, and we get sodium voltage the channels that open, we get action potentials produced, which will travel down the transverse tubule, and once down in the transverse tubule, they're going to activate voltage-gated calcium channels, which cause calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which uh, contains most of the calcium. So remember, the SR is actually um, the smooth ER of the, of the skeletal muscle cell. And its primary job is to store calcium in its terminal, what we call cisternae, which is plural for cistern. And again, you know what a cistern is, you might have one at your house, it holds things. In this case, it's holding calcium. When the calcium is released, it goes into the sarcoplasm and it's going to interact with the sarcomere. And that's where we left off, and that's what we're gonna pick up talking about right now. 
So, what happens to the calcium? Why is the calcium so important? It's important because calcium will get the process of muscle contraction going by binding to a molecule called troponin. Troponin is a lot like a, um, I guess it's sort of like a key in a lock in a way. Um, troponin is bound to uh, a protein called tropomyosin, which is seen here in pink. And tropomyosin's job is to basically cover up binding sites on actin for the myosin heads. So what calcium does is it binds the troponin, and when it does that, it sort of unlocks, you know, it's like a key, it unlocks this uh, ability for tropomyosin to move away from those binding sites on actin for myosin, okay? So calcium is released from the SR, it binds the troponin to move tropomyosin away from the binding site on actin. Now, it's possible for the myosin head to bind, okay? Now, when the myosin head binds to actin, we call this a cross bridge. So this is called a cross bridge. Um, so let's take a look and see how this occurs. So let me skip that. Okay. So calcium binds, moves binds the troponin, moves tropomyosin away from the binding site on actin. Now, the myosin head is able to bind, theoretically, but something else has to happen to myosin. Myosin has a special place on its head for ATP. And it's actually kind of almost, it's a site that acts almost like an enzyme. It's what it, it does is it'll break ATP into ADP and phosphate. Once this occurs, notice how the head will flex backward. We say we, it cocks into place. So ATP binds and then ATP is going to um, basically disassociate into ADP and phosphate. And when this occurs, the head cocks back. Only at that point, Will the myosin head bind to the actin? It can't do that if ATP doesn't bind. So, again, calcium is released from the SR, binds to troponin to move tropomyosin away from the myosin binding site on actin. Okay, but the other thing that has to occur for the cross bridge to take place to actually occur for myosin to bind to actin is ATP has to bind to the head and be hydrolyzed into ADP and phosphate. Then myosin head can reach up and grab the actin. Then what occurs is phosphate, the phosphate from the hydrolyzed ATP is going to be released and when it is released, that's gonna cause what we call the power stroke. The power stroke is when the myosin head flexes forward. And as it does this, as it, as it flexes forward like this, it's pulling the actin over itself towards the center of the sarcomere. So the actin will move from both sides of the sarcomere closer to the center. And that pulls the Z discs together, and it pulls the A bands closer together, and so forth. Okay? So, once again, we have calcium released from the SR. Calcium binds to troponin to move tropomyosin away from the myosin binding site on actin. ATP binds to the myosin head and is hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphate. Then the cross bridge occurs. When the phosphate is released, a power stroke occurs, which brings the actin proteins closer to the center of the sarcomere from both ends. And that will shorten the sarcomere and ultimately the muscle, the muscle will contract. So this last part here shows us what we call the contraction relaxation cycle. So here we have our myosin head 
it is not in the position to form a cross bridge yet. ATP binds that coxa head back when ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphate. Cox back reaches up now, grabs the actin and forms the cross bridge. Then the, the phosphate is released. This causes the head to flex forward, which pulls the actin towards the center of the sarcomere a little bit more. Shortly thereafter, the ADP is released, and then a new ATP binds to myosin to allow it to form another cross bridge once the ADP is hydrolyzed. So ultimately, if a person dies, why you develop rigor mortis is in part because you're not generating fresh ATP. And if you can't, if you cannot, um, Basically, if you can't bind ATP, if myosin head can't bind to ATP, then it's gonna keep its cross bridge where it is. It's not gonna release it. It's not until the ATP binds to the myosin head again that the cross bridge is released. And so therefore, the muscles stay in a constant state of contraction, which is known as rigor or rigor mortis. But rigor mortis can occur depending upon how a person dies like if, for example, they were running from somebody and they were killed, or if they were in a cold environment or a warm environment, rigor can set up at different times. Um, but it, over time, rigor goes away because then the proteins start to denature and they start to break down, including the actin and myosin, so then the body becomes very flaccid. Um, so that's a very happy thought for this beautiful Thursday morning in August. Is it August? Yep, August 1st, today. Okay, so now you know everything you didn't want to know about what happens when you die. Okay, so any questions about this? All right, so lastly, um, this last slide just basically tells us that Calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it goes to troponin to initiate that cross bridge cycling. Um, when action potentials stop, when the action potentials stop, the muscle will relax because calcium channels close and calcium is pumped back into the SR. So you're gonna need ATP for both relaxation as well as contraction because to pump the calcium back into the SR, where it's already in high concentration, is gonna take energy. And of course, we've seen how ATP was necessary for cross bridge formation, power stroke, and all of that um, for the contraction process. Now, I can't stress enough to you guys how important correct electrolyte balance is in your bodies. In terms of ions, that's what we're talking about when we say electrolyte. My father, when he was 86, had a hernia operation. And during the hernia operation, they found that he had cancer in his colon, which had metastasized to the pelvic cavity. So when he went home, and I don't know, hope, I mean, some of you guys might know this, but when you have colon cancer, not only do things, I mean, not work well with the colon in terms of, you know, you may have diarrhea and some other things, but also things don't work well with the first part of the alimentary canal either, your, your mouth. And food tastes bad, it tastes metallic, like it doesn't taste good at all. And so my father was not eating at all. He, he just wasn't. I mean, he had this surgery and I was like giving him like little pieces of cheese or meat or something, you know, just so he could he could eat something. But he would eat, even even the little bit that I gave him, he would he wasn't drinking because it always made him go to the bathroom, so he didn't want to. So what happened was a week after his surgery, which was actually uh, Cinco de Mayo, it was Cinco de Mayo, I remember, um, a Saturday. I came to the house, and my mother said. No, something's wrong with your dad. And I said, really? It turned out 
this man who has no problems getting up out of the chair, doesn't walk with a walker, doesn't have a cane or anything like that. Um, he, he couldn't get out of the chair to go to the bathroom. He could not get out of the chair and he needed a walker. And then when he tried to walk, he couldn't even lift his feet. I had to drag him to the bathroom practically. It was that bad. And what had happened was, because he didn't have a stroke, I was worried about that, but he didn't have a stroke. But the problem was, is that his electrolytes were so out of balance. He didn't have enough calcium to be able to, to, to do the muscle contraction he needed to move. His body was conserving those electrolytes for other important functions like keeping your heart beating, keeping your digestive tract working, keeping you know your lungs working, your nervous system working, but it was conserving it and his skeletal muscles were not working. He went to the hospital and got an IV, um, saline solution, you know, some salt water, got it into his bloodstream and probably within the next hour and a half he was okay. He was fine, he could get up, he could walk. So I can't stress en enough to you guys how important these ions are that we talk about. The sodium, the chloride, the calcium, potassium. Like these things are so important in our bodies uh, that we keep, we keep things um, in appropriate balance. So I have a little uh, video I want to show you here. This is basically a whole summary of the first part of this muscular system chapter that we just covered. So if you want to reference this, I just simply Googled muscle contraction um, animation. You can see up there. Uh, and, and this comes right up. It's a really good video, and there's only one little error in it, which I want to uh, stress to you. I just taught you that what causes the power stroke is the release of what? Do you remember? What was it? Not calcium, but phosphate. Okay, remember that ATP binds to myosin and is hydrolyzed, which allows it to reach up and grab the axle. When the phosphate is released, then the power stroke occurs. And then the ADP is released and a fresh ATP binds to allow the cross bridge to break. A new cross bridge can form once the ATP is hydrolyzed again. So it's important to remember that the phosphate is what causes that power stroke, okay? Phosphate release is what causes the power stroke. They've done research on this years ago that you learned this process. People thought that it was the fact that ATP was hydrolyzed that caused the power stroke, but it's not. They learned that it's actually the phosphate being released. So this video has that a little bit wrong, and I'll point that out when we get there. But everything else is accurate. You use muscles every day to do activities. This woman is using muscles to breathe, circulate blood, and move her hand to take notes. Your cardiac and smooth muscle tissues are involuntary. You do not consciously control their actions. Skeletal muscle works under voluntary control. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments, giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the Z lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. 
Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the end line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. The ADP and the inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin and that's the one thing that's inaccurate, right? What should have happened first is the phosphate should be released, that causes the power stroke, then the ADP is released. But they showed that the power stroke happened and then both things were released at once. And that was the one inaccurate thing about this video. Till a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding, add more contraction, or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, Calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils, where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z lines draw closer to the M line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison, a muscle can produce enough force to move the body, allowing you to take notes. There. So that's, I think, a real comprehensive video that covers everything that we just, literally just talked about. So if you want to look at that, I say go for it. I've used that for several years now, and the students seem to really like it. But just remember that there's that one inaccurate part. That's the key thing, right? That one inaccurate part, because what causes the power stroke is the phosphate release, not ADP and phosphate are released at the same time. That doesn't happen. Phosphate's released first, then the ADP. When the phosphate's released, that causes the power stroke. Okay. Now, part two of the muscular system, we're going to be discussing here a little bit about um, skeletal muscle contraction, including the concepts of twitches, summation, tetanus, how the velocity of contraction is impacted by something called load, and what a length tension relationship is, and how having an appropriate length, length tension relationship allows you to actually generate more power with your muscles. Um, we'll talk about the different types of energy we use with different types of exercise, um, what's meant by oxygen debt. We're actually going to be talking a lot about exercise physiology here in this particular part of the chapter. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, skeletal muscle fiber types and how they can change a little bit with different types of exercise training, whether it be aerobic conditioning or weight training. And then we're going to talk briefly about um, smooth muscle contraction as well. Okay, so first of all, twitch, summation, and tightness. When you have a rapid contraction and relaxation of your skeletal muscle, this is called a twitch. And 
you know what this feels like. For example, if the extraocular muscles around your eye are very tired because you've been studying a lot, sometimes you get a little twitching sensation, right? It's in, in those muscles around your eye. What that is, it's a rapid contraction and relaxation that has occurred with the muscle. If the second stimulus occurs before muscles relax from the first, uh, from the first contraction, then the second twitch is going to be greater, and we call this summation. In a way, it's kind of like what we talked about with EPSPs. Remember, if you have one EPSP that happens and then another one happens like right at the same time in the same place, then the second EPSP summates on the first and it's greater and gets us closer to threshold. In a way, this is a similar concept. What happens here, we see we have one twitch and then the next twitch occurs right before the first twitch has stopped. So the second twitch has a greater amplitude. Why is this? It's because there's not enough time for calcium to come back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it basically accumulates. And because it accumulates, you can generate more power on the second, the second twitch. So that's the idea of summation. Then contractions of varying strength, which are called graded, are obtained by simulation of varying numbers of fibers, which we've already discussed um, in the first part of this chapter when we discussed motor units, right? Motor units are a, um, a neuron and all the skeletal muscle fibers that it innervates. Essentially, the more that we recruit, the stronger our contractions can be. The more motor units we recruit, the stronger our contractions are and the greater the load we can move. So again, contractions of varying strength, which are called graded contractions, are obtained by stimulating varying numbers of muscle fibers, aka varying numbers of motor units. So if a muscle is stimulated by an increasing frequency of electrical shocks, the tension will increase to a maximum, which we call incomplete tetanus. So if, for example, we take a muscle and we shock it five times per second, we'll see that there is sort of what we call a staircase effect that's occurring here. Our first twitch occurs and the second twitch starts before the first twitch is complete. So the second twitch sums and is greater than the first one. And each subsequent twitch gets greater and greater in amplitude until we plateau. Because at this point, we've actually gotten all the calcium out there that we can have. There's no more calcium we can release. So we call this effect, when we have this little staircase like reading, we call it a trape effect um, or staircase effect. Now, as we shock the muscle more frequently at 10 shocks per second, you can still see that we have individual twitches, although these individual twitches are not as discernible. They're actually a little bit, um, they're closer in succession. You can't see the individual twitches as much because there are so many happening each second. So we basically um, have the same type of thing. Ultimately, we kind of staircase our way up until we plateau. Then, at 60 shocks per second, the twitching is occurring so quickly that we plateau very, very fast, right? There are no individual twitches here. We call this complete tetanus because we cannot see individual twitches here. Incomplete tetanus is illustrated by these two examples where we can see individual twitches they're happening very close together. But with complete tetanus, like we see here, there's no relaxation of the muscle at all. So as I mentioned before, if the muscle is repeatedly stimulated with maximum voltage to produce individual twitches, as we said, each twitch gets larger, and we call this, and it looks like you're, you're basically climbing stairs, so we call this the staircase or trek effect. Um, which again is caused by accumulation of calcium because you have more and more calcium that's released it's out there already so that's why the twitches get greater and greater but eventually it plateaus because you only have so much calcium once it's all out there there's nothing do you have any questions about this so far 
Okay, so velocity of contraction. For a muscle to shorten, it has to generate a force that is greater than its load, of course, right? In other words, if you're lifting a weight, the muscle has to be able to overcome the weight of what you're, you're lifting, right, in order to move it. So what we see is that when we have a lighter load, the load uh, can be moved more quickly. The contraction velocity is faster. Why is that? I did mention this on Tuesday. If I'm lifting a pencil versus a 50 pound weight, why can I lift the pencil more quickly? Because of what? What don't I have to have as many of? Hmm? Just because I already added your class participation doesn't mean you don't have to participate. Think. Think about it. What did, what did we just mention a few minutes ago? We were talking about how when we want to get a stronger contraction, what do we need to do? We need to recruit more motor units, right? So essentially, we can move a light load faster because we don't have to have that many motor units. But the heavier the load, the more motor units we have to recruit. And it takes time to do that. So that's why it's a little slower. So when you see here on the y-axis of this diagram, it shows the velocity of shortening, how quickly the muscle can shorten. Here on the x-axis, we have the force, which is basically our load. So how much weight we need to lift. So you'll notice that as you get a heavier and heavier load, the velocity of shortening gets slower and slower until we're at zero, which means that now we've recruited all the motor units, but they're not sufficient to lift the load. So in this case, the muscles are contracting, but they're not moving anything. So we call this type of contraction isometric. Iso means the same. Um, metric means that it's not moving staying the same length. It's contracting, but it's staying the same length. So there are a couple of other types of contraction as well. We just said that isometric contraction is where we have um, our, our load, our force, uh, uh, is actually something that our muscles cannot overcome. So the exerted force of the muscles does not cause the load to move and the length of the fibers remain constant, although all the motor units are contracting. The muscle is contracting, but there's no movement at a joint. During um, these other types of uh, contractions, either the muscle, there is movement at the joint and either the muscle is shortening and contracting or it's lengthening and it's contracting. So concentric muscle contraction I think can be illustrated um, by the tibialis anterior muscles. If you recall, the tibialis anterior runs along the tibial crest, and its job is to dorsiflex the foot. So when you dorsiflex the foot, like when you're striking your heel on the ground as you're walking, the tibialis anterior is contracting. Now, it is contracting specifically in which type of way? Concentrically or eccentrically? Looking at those definitions, how is it contracting? You got two choices. 50 50. Let's pick one. If you've ever been wrong, has anybody ever, like, blown up or has anything bad happened to you if you've been wrong in this class? What are you afraid of? Pick one. You got two choices. I'm not that like terrible if you're wrong. Huh? Concentric. Concentric. See? And you're right. And look, it's even better when you're right. Okay? Hi. Like, I should be a dentist. Okay. Concentric contractions are when the muscle is shortening, when it's it's, it's contracting. So tibialis anterior during heel strike is concentrically contracting. It's shortening. 
and you can feel that muscle bulk up a little because it's shortening if you, if you feel along your physio pad. Then, when you go to put your foot flat, unless you just have a foot drop, which some people do have this problem, like if they've, for example, had a stroke, sometimes tibialis anterior isn't functioning properly and they have to put ankle foot orthosis on them. Um, but when you go to put your foot flat, generally you control, right? Like right now, I mean, I'm controlling, I'm not thinking about it, but I'm controlling how quickly my foot hits the ground. If I weren't controlling that, I would be walking like that, right? And I don't. So that type of contraction where the muscle contracts, but it's getting longer, is called eccentric contraction. So tibialis anterior, when you go to put your foot flat, is um, eccentrically contracting at that point in time. And actually, eccentric contraction a lot of times is harder on the muscle than concentric contraction. And specifically with that muscle, you can get shin splints. You've heard of that, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, they can hurt a little bit. So concentric, eccentric. Any questions there? And that's why they say when you go to work out, like in the gym, or if you're doing any types of weight training, you should always control the movement of the joint in both directions. When you're doing bicep curl, you're going to you know, control concentrically, and then you don't just let the weights fall down. You shouldn't do that. You should put the weights back down in a controlled manner because you're concentrically working the muscle, or you're eccentrically working the muscle. And eccentric contraction also helps to develop the muscle as well. So, um, tendons and connective tissues, these are elastic. They absorb tension as a muscle contracts. They recoil as a muscle relaxes, and they spring back to the resting leg. We know that tendons and connective tissues are made up of a lot of collagen, and we know collagen is very elastic. Remember, elastic doesn't mean that something can stretch, that's compliant, we learned that in lab. If, but when you stretch something, can it bounce back? Can it recoil back to its original position? That's the elasticity part of it. And muscles having all this connective tissue does have an ability to be very elastic. They can get back to their original shape. Now, the strength of the muscle contraction is influenced by a couple of parameters. First, the frequency of stimulation. Of course, the more frequently you stimulate a muscle, as we just saw with the truck effect, the, um, the stronger the muscle contraction will be because we get more and more calcium that's available. So there is a directly proportional relationship of the frequency of stimulation to the strength of muscle contraction. As you increase the frequency, you increase the strength of contraction. The thickness of each fiber. What do you think is going to happen here? If you have a thicker fiber, what do you think is going to happen to the strength of muscle contraction? It's going to go up or down. Once again, this is one of those two choice questions. It's two choice, that's all. Go up or go down. Should we take a vote? Gosh, it's like I gotta be real creative today. Um, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna go up or down? How many say up? Oh. Okay, how many say down? <laughs> you have to vote. Okay, so I think the rest of you say, since no one else voted, Jake said, Jake said it goes up, everybody else said it goes down. I'm just gonna assume that. You're all wrong except for Jake. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Oh, I, you didn't say it loud enough, you gotta be assertive. <laughs> okay, yes, it goes up. Why does it go up? Because what do you have more of? What do you have more of in a thicker fiber? Come on, think guys, what's in a skeletal muscle fiber? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about collagen already. That's the tendons and all that. But what's inside a muscle cell, inside a muscle fiber, that gives its contraction ability? The sarcomere. Yeah, after that, I used to see you were right there. You were good. 
at adenomyosin, which is found in the sarcomere. So if you have a thicker fiber, that simply means that you have to have, what makes it thicker is that you have to have more actin and myosin. That's what makes the cell larger. So the thicker the fiber, the stronger the muscle contraction strength. If you have more actin and myosin, you can produce more power. And the last one is the initial length of the muscle fiber. And this is what we're gonna get into. This is gonna be kind of a variable thing. Essentially, when you work out, when you do things like Pilates or yoga, you sort of do like a combination of exercises that are both strengthening and stretching, right? So you're trying to get like, you know, your posture is gonna be good. It's gonna, you're, basically everything's gonna be right along the plumb line. You know, ears are gonna be with your shoulders, shoulders with your hips and your knees and your ankles. So you have good, you know, and you're, you're strong, right? You're stronger that way. So why are you stronger? whenever your muscles are appropriately strengthened and stretched because they are at their ideal resting length. So if you have, for example, a muscle that is already, before you even get it to contract, if this muscle is uh, already like contracted uh, too much before you even start to contract it, Notice that the actin is basically overlapping the myosin already, and they're butting against each other. There's no more contraction that can take place. So obviously the muscle can't be very strong. Now that's an extreme case, right? But you think about it, sometimes people have bad posture, their shoulders are forward, the um, pec minor muscle, the pec major muscle is short, right? The rhomboids in the back are gonna to be too stretched, they're gonna to be too long. And you know what? You feel really tired when you have poor posture because it actually takes your muscles more energy to be able to keep your posture than if they were at a good resting length um, as it is. So why, if we have a muscle that is overly stretched, um, before it contracts, notice that actin cannot interact with myosin. So therefore, how are you going to generate contraction? You're not going to generate much power at all in that circumstance. So the ideal resting length is someplace between our maximal contracted phase and our maximal stretching phase, somewhere in the middle. And again, that's where these types of exercises like Pilates and yoga and things like that are going to help the muscles to get to their ideal resting length so that they're ready to generate as much power as they can. And that ideal resting length is going to allow for a little bit of actin overlap of myosin, but not too much like over here, and not too little like over here in this case. So this way we can generate the most power. We can form the most cross bridges and we can produce the maximum number of power strokes. Do you have any questions about that? All right, so moving into energy requirements of skeletal muscles. Okay, so skeletal muscles, they respire anaerobically during the first minute, minute and a half of moderate to heavy exercise. Like, so if you're sprinting, if you're a sprinter and you're only running for about a minute and a half at maximum speed, you're pretty much making energy through glycolysis, not through cellular respiration. You're making your energy anaerobic. Why? Because, yes, you might be running, but your body, if you have, like, you know, if you basically haven't gotten yourself uh, you haven't been running before, your cardiopulmonary system needs time in order to get the sympathetic nervous system to dilate the bronchioles, increase the heart rate, you know, all of those things, increase respiratory rates, the depth of breathing, all of that stuff. It takes a little bit of time for the autonomic nervous system to kick in. So that's one reason. Um, if the exercise is moderate, aerobic respiration 
um, will contribute to the majority of muscle requirements after the first two minutes. So if you're jogging, the first couple of minutes, you're making energy anaerobically. The rest of the time, it's through cellular respiration aerobically. Once the cardiopulmonary system catches up. But if you're only sprinting for a short time and you're trying to get a quick sprint in under a minute, you're going to only make your energy glycolytically. Okay, so there are two parameters that can tell us a little bit about a person's health. And both of these things uh, can be variable. They can change with gender, age, course level of fitness. Um, so for example, the first thing is maximum oxygen uptake, also known as a VO2 max, or your aerobic capacity. This is your maximum rate of oxygen consumption. So we studied this in lab when we did our spirometry exercise, if you remember. We were taking a look at vital capacity, like your aerobic capacity, and we know that the two things that you had to measure for that when you were when you were looking at your observed versus what was predicted for you, your vital capacities, we had to do that measurement the first thing on that lab report. Um, you you needed to calculate your predicted vital capacity, which was related to both your height, right, and your age. That's why we measured your height and then you had your age in there because those two variables have been directly linked to what your vital capacity should be. So age, your height, your gender, all these things um, affect that. Lactate threshold or anaerobic threshold is basically the percent of your maximum oxygen uptake where you have a significant rise in blood lactate levels. So generally speaking, you can make your energy aerobically, but there will come a time when you fatigue. And what essentially happens, there are several things that happen when you fatigue, but one of the things that causes fatigue is a rise in lactic acid levels. We know that skeletal muscle cells, they may run out of energy. They'll go into their glycogen stores, but then in time, they may run out of what they need to produce energy aerobically. So therefore, the lactate level is going to go up, and maybe the liver through the Cori cycle isn't going to be able to keep, keep up with everything. So at some point, there will be enough of a rise in lactate levels that you'll fatigue. So the lactate threshold is the percentage of the maximum oxygen uptake in which you have a significant rise in the lactate level. And in a healthy person, this is going to be about 50 to 70% of your VO2 max at which time you have to, you know, again, your fatigability. And that will depend upon your, um, your level of fitness. So in terms of how skeletal muscles um, get energy and how they work metabolically, it's gonna depend on the type of exercise that you're doing as to what type of energy or what type of fuel resource that the muscles will be using. So during light exercise, like if you're walking, strolling around, most of the energy is derived from aerobic respiration of fatty acids. When you're moderately exercising, energy is derived equally from glucose and from fatty acids. So this is like if you're kickboxing or doing some kind of heavier aerobic activity. During heavy exercise, like weight training, glucose supplies most of the energy um, and in general, the liver is going to increase glycogenolysis because we're going to need more blood glucose. We're going to need more glucose in the bloodstream. And we also have um, a special carrier transporter called the GLUT4 carrier that's going to move to muscle cells, plasma membranes, so that um, they can take in more glucose to make energy. And this diagram is nice because it color codes all these different um, requirements. So we have here um, the beach bar showing us 
energy requirements of muscle during mild exercise, moderate, and heavy. And this on this side is basically our time. So these are our, our minutes, um, our minutes that, um, that we're doing the activity. So the, the purple shows us muscle glycogen. Uh, really the purple and the red I think of as being like the, the glucose as the energy source. And the green and the yellow are basically uh, fatty acids, okay? So you can see with the mild exercise that the first 30 minutes of mild exercise, like walking around, we're pretty much using fatty acids, the green and the yellow, okay? So we're, 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 we're making our energy with, um, with the fatty acids uh, a lot more. And then as we continue with the exercise um, into you know, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, notice that we're using a lot more fatty acids, plasma-free fatty acids. Hardly any glucose are we using, hardly any at all. But that's why they say, you know, mild exercise can help with weight loss. And the longer that you do it, the more fatty acids that you tend to burn. During mild exercise, initially the first 30 minutes, we're going to be using, again, if you take a look at the, um, the purple and the red indicates the glucose, we're using about as much glucose as we're using our fatty acids here. Um, but then as we continue to do this exercise, notice that our fatty acid usage is gonna be greater proportionally than uh, our glucose usage. So again, moderate exercise is especially good for weight loss, aerobic, like kickboxing or um, just a, you know running on a treadmill or something like that. The longer you do it, the more fatty acids you burn. And heavy exercise like weightlifting is pretty much all glucose and glycogen that we use. We don't hardly use any fatty acids for that. We just need quick energy and it's anaerobic. And generally, when you look at this, you see that they don't have more than 30 minutes here. I mean, you're not going to be doing deadlifts for more than 30 minutes, right? That's pretty heavy exercise. Do you have any questions about that? All right, so oxygen beds. When you stop exercising, do you just go back to your normal rate of breathing? No. For a while, you're going to be huffing and puffing a little bit until you replenish all the oxygen that you utilize during that exercise. Because what happens is, is when you, when you are, for example, as you guys are doing right now, you're resting, and we know, we know that red blood cells carry around a lot of oxygen, right? And red blood cells carry around this oxygen on hemoglobin. And hemoglobin has four iron molecules, which oxygen binds to. Now, when you're sitting there like you guys are right now, you know, just sort of hanging out, yawning a little bit, you know, doing your, your thing, taking your notes, you're probably, when your blood goes past your tissues, you're probably on average gonna unload about one oxygen from each hemoglobin molecule which means that the venous blood that leaves your tissues is going to be about 75% saturated with oxygen. So does this make sense to you? This is why I never, ever say that venous blood is deoxygenated, which means it has none, because it does. It does have oxygen in it. It just has less oxygen than in arterial blood. So basically, when um, you're at rest, you're only extracting about 25% of your oxygen from your, your blood cells. But whenever you exercise, you need a lot more oxygen and you're gonna on average extract about three oxygens from your hemoglobin and your blood cells. So the venous blood leaving will only be about 25% saturated. You're extracting about 75% of your oxygen from that. So it takes a little bit of time to recover that oxygen debt that you have. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so when oxygen's withdrawn, 
uh, from hemoglobin and myoglobin. And again, myoglobin is like hemoglobin, but it's found in skeletal muscle cells, some skeletal muscle cells. And also because of oxygen needed for the metabolism of lactic acid, which was generated by anaerobic respiration. So we're gonna need energy um, for the Cori cycle to occur as well. See where the metabolism part is important for this chapter? This is why we can't skip it. We do need it. Um, okay, so phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate, it's called both things, is actually a real quick form of energy that skeletal muscle cells have. During exercise, ATP can be used faster than can be generated by cellular respiration. So what happens is, is that the skeletal muscle cells skeletal muscle cells, they have this um, creatine phosphate, which is just a molecule of creatine with a phosphate attached to it. And when we need quick energy, that phosphate can be given to ADP um, to generate ATP. And then if we don't need ATP, then the phosphate on ATP can be given back to creatine. And again, stored that way. So it's a source of high energy phosphate to regenerate ATP from ADP. It's very efficient and so efficient that muscle ATP concentration only decreases slightly from rest to heavy exercise. There is an, an enzyme called creatine phosphokinase, or CPK, which transfers the phosphate from creatine to ADP. So this is called creatine phosphokinase, also known as CPK. Where have you heard of CPK before? Anybody? Have you heard of CPK before? Right? Go to the hospital, anybody get like some blood work done or a patient has blood work done. What do they do that for a lot of times? Lactate dehydrogenase, LDH, CPK, they look for these these enzymes. And these are not only, but these, uh, a lot of times they call them the cardiac enzymes. It's that they suspect somebody had a heart attack, the cardiac muscle cells would rupture, and you would see, because cardiac muscle tissue also has creatine, um, creatine, um, uh, phosphocreatine, or creatine phosphate, whichever, like I said, you could say either way. It also has it not just skeletal muscle, and whenever those cells rupture because of a lack of oxygenation or something like that, then basically that enzyme is released and it goes up, those levels go up CPK. Does that make sense? Any questions? Do you find this somewhat interesting or is this stuff you already knew before? Did you know all this before? Should we just skip this chapter? No, really, I'm just curious. Have you had any kind of skeletal muscle physiology before in any of your classes? You did. High school biology? Or, okay. So you had a little bit. Anyone else want to share? My guess is no. No, you don't want to share right at this point. I think, it's, I think it's interesting because you like to hear about these concepts, just like working out, going to the gym. Yeah. And you know people. Yes, Christian. <laughs> I'm so glad somebody raised a hand to participate in nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Christian. Does creatine have any supplement? Well, I mean, just like anything, right? If I mean your body can make it naturally. But if you're taking something into your body that your body hasn't made because your body keeps that all in balance, then you could run a risk of having problems with your liver, you know, 
uh, later on if you really overload the system. Um, it's kind of like, well, it's sort of like steroids. You know, people, I mean, I'm not saying creatine is not the same as steroids. I mean, it can help if you're using it. Like, you know, you have to make sure that you're not taking in more than what you need for your particular weightlifting program. You know what I'm saying? Because like if your body's not using it, then it could be harder on your on your other organs. So you just need to make sure that that's in balance. But it's kind of like you know steroids. I mean, we we make steroids. We talked about that. We make testosterone. We, we make estrogen. All of us. And testosterone, um, you have enough of it. Well, what's testosterone's role? Testosterone helps for actin and myosin to be produced, right? So when actin and myosin produce more of it, your muscles get larger. But if you take it externally, it may help you, but it can affect obviously your temperament because having too much testosterone can obviously uh, affect your mood, your behavior, and be a problem. Also not to mention, mm -hmm cause issues with the prostate. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're a man, obviously, if you're a woman, it's an issue. But anyhow, that was a good question. I went off a little too much. Right there. But any other questions or comments? All right, so let's look at the different types of skeletal muscle fibers. This is where I think it gets very interesting. And as you guys do your exercise programs, I'm sure everybody in here exercises, you will be thinking about this stuff and what's actually happening inside your body. So, in general, all muscle bellies that we have in our bodies, you know, quadriceps, vastus rectum, vastus rectus, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, like all those different muscle bellies, they have different combinations of three different types of fibers. And they, this book classifies them as type 1, type 2A, and type 2X, but sometimes you'll see them classified as like slow twitch or ST fibers, they call them. Um, just be aware of that. This book uses this terminology to describe the fibers. But they have different properties. And so we have, first of all, we have um, what are called slow twitch or type 1 fibers. Slow twitching, slow fatiguing fibers. You're going to find this in muscles which can't fatigue quickly, or maybe so muscles that help with your posture, for example. These are going to be slow twitch fibers. Um, the soleus muscle, which is in your calf, right? You can walk for a long time. You don't really feel like a burn in your, you know, your soleus. Even in really even in your gastrocnemius, you don't feel like it start, you know, lack of gas building up and getting tired and fatigued, because these fibers, these muscles are actually made up of a lot of slow twitch and slow fatiguing fibers, and we're going to see why they're slow to fatigue in the next couple of slides. We also have fast twitch fibers, and there are two types here. There's a fast fatigue fiber, which is um, type 2X, we call them. Um, type 2X, they fatigue very quickly. Um, but they reach their peak tension very, very fast. So A illustrates this. They, they, they reach peak tension very quickly and they fatigue very quickly. So they're like a flash. They have their period, they're done. They are, um, I think most of the fibers in the um, extraocular muscles of the eye are gonna have a lot of fast switch back fatiguing. If you, if you use your lateral rectus and medial rectus muscles in your eyes, you can try it. If you look right and left real quickly, like for a couple of times, you're going to start to feel a little bit of burning. Right? You're not doing it. You don't want to do it. I swear. Give you activities. Like you don't, you don't want to do it. No, but when you're at home, when you're at home, I have no control over what goes on here. No, when, 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 you, when you go home, and I'm not there, and you don't have to feel like you're defying me then. You can try it, you'll see. Those fibers do fatigue quickly. They, they start to burn, have it, um, problems. 
Now, the other type that's in the middle is the fast uh, twitch and a little slower to fatigue fibers. Um, and these are the type 2A fibers. These are going to reach their peak tension a little more slowly, but they can hold the peak tension longer. They don't fatigue nearly as quickly. You're gonna find that in muscles that generate power, but that have to be used over and over again, and they can't fatigue. So like a lot of the gastrocnemius fibers are going to be type 2A. So the um, gastrocnemius, again, doesn't generally get tired if you're walking. I mean, if you're going up a big steep hill, yeah, you might feel a little bit of burning there. But um, generally, if you're just walking on a flat surface, you're not really gonna fatigue, but you can generate power through that. So let's look at some of the properties of the different fiber types. Type one, which we said is very slow to fatigue, slow to reach peak tension, slow to fatigue. These are also called slow oxidative fibers and are red. So I mentioned this before, that a lot of your postural muscles are going to have a lot of these fiber types. They're red because they have um, a lot of myoglobin, which is like hemoglobin in the sense that it carries oxygen. It also has a red pigment associated with it. So it has a lot of myoglobin, which means it can produce energy aerobically through aerobic cellular respiration. And that's why it takes longer to fatigue because it can make its energy very quickly. It has a rich capillary supply, a lot of mitochondria, and aerobic enzymes. Um, so the type one fibers, they are very slow to fatigue. They can hold their peak contraction pretty long. Um, and they are red in color, so darker. If you remember, well, again, if you didn't look at the cat muscles, then you won't remember. But in the cat, when you look at the abdominal muscles or like the intercostal muscles, which is like if you go to the restaurant, that's your ribs, right? That's your rib meat. It's dark. It's dark. Those fibers, they don't fatigue quickly, right? Hopefully not. You need those muscles for breathing, especially if you're running somewhere. And so they're darker because they have a lot of myoglobin. They have when you look at the abdominal muscles, a lot of those are a lot darker too, because they have a lot of myoglobin. When you look at a chicken, what's the dark meat? The thigh. Like, I don't know, I never paid attention. Like, oh. The thigh, right. How do chickens get around? They walk a lot. Yeah. I'm really testing your farming knowledge. Alright, how how far do chickens fly? Do they fly far? No. What color is the breast meat? White. White. Because the breast meat has a different type of fiber composition, which is made up of the fast fatiguing fiber types. So the fast fatigue fiber types, type 2X, they have a lot of glycogen, but very few capillaries and myoglobin and mitochondria. So they're gonna be white in color. And the breast meat is white because it's fast fatiguing fibers that make it up and chickens can't fly far, they get tired, right? They don't do too much flying. All right, so then in the middle, and these are pretty desirable to have, we have type 2A fibers, which are known as fast oxidative fibers. These are adapted to contract fast using aerobic metabolism. So these actually do have some mitochondria and they have capillaries. They have more oxygen aerobic capacity to make their energy. So that's why they don't fatigue as fast. And I have a table here, which actually describes some of the properties of each of the fiber types we just talked about. And the thing is, when you do certain types of exercise, okay, like for example, we're gonna see as you do aerobic training, for example, if you have a muscle that has a lot of type 2X fibers, the fast fatiguing ones, those fibers can actually be converted to type 2A fibers. And that's why when you do prolonged aerobic conditioning, you tend to fatigue less quickly. 
as you progress and improve. It helps to improve your aerobic capacity. So, and again, the type 2A fibers, they have, um, they have uh, more mitochondria, so they can actually make their energy aerobically. So, in terms of the diameter, they're intermediate. The Z-line thickness, uh, you don't really have to know that. They have an intermediate resistance to fatigue. They have a lot of capillaries, high myoglobin content, aerobic respiration is how they make their energy. So they have a high oxidative capacity, but they also have the ability to make energy glycolytically too. They have a fast twitch rate, but they do have a low fatigue rate. So when we compare the 2A to the 2X, 2X has a large diameter, which means it can generate a lot of power, but it has a very high, high um, fatigue ability. So it's got a low resistance to fatigue. Has high glycogen content though, because it's always using the muscle glycogen for its quick energy. Capillaries aren't gonna be very abundant here. Myoglobin, there's not much. Makes energy not through cellular respiration. It makes it glycolytically or anaerobically is what we say. Okay, because remember when we say we're using the glycolytic pathway only, that means that we're making lactic acid and we're doing it anaerobically. And then lastly, the type one fibers, the slow oxidative fibers. These guys, they have um, a very high resistance to fatigue, a lot of capillaries, a high myoglobin content, makes energy aerobically. So there's a high aerobic capacity, but a low glycolytic ability. And so again, muscles are gonna have different combinations of these three types of fibers. But if you train, you can start to make your fibers become the more efficient fiber type so that you don't fatigue as quickly as you get stronger. Okay, so any questions about the three muscle fiber types? Nope. Okay, so how do we fatigue? Well, this is actually something that they're not completely sure about. I mean, there are some things that we can kind of quantify. Um, for example, uh, people get fatigued because you generally have sustained contractions, which causes an accumulation of extracellular potassium, which we know that potassium needs to be in high abundance inside the cell for action potentials to occur. So until like the sodium potassium pump can catch up, if you have your ions out of balance, you're not gonna be able to generate new muscle contractions. So that can cause your fatigue. Um, it occurs in moderate exercise, as slow twitch fibers deplete glycogen stores. And then we, <clears throat> we start to recruit fast twitch fibers. And again, if, we're, if we don't have a lot of type 2A fibers, we have a lot of type 2X, our fatigue ability is gonna be quicker because we're gonna be making our energy glycolytically, which isn't that efficient. So you are gonna start. But if you have more type 2A fibers, then you're gonna be able to generate your energy using aerobic methods. And then this is what's like lesser known in terms of how this occurs. <clears throat> There's also like mental or central fatigue that also can occur. And when we talk about central fatigue, you can kind of guess maybe some of the reasons for that. Um, for example, maybe your motor pathways in your brain can't generate the um, neurotransmitters that they need to be able to appropriately get muscle contraction to occur. So that can, can also be a factor. So you do have your normal physiological fatigue, just you know at the skeletal muscle level, but you also have it um, mentally. <laughs> and that's not as well understood. Any questions about that? <coughs> Excuse me. That was a sneeze. Some people aren't sure. I think it sounds like a cough sometimes, but it, it was a sneeze. Huh? Oh, thank you. Somebody did bless me. That was nice. Appreciate it. All right. So, uh, moving on here. Mm. 
we have, um, again, some things that occur that ultimately uh, lead us to uh, become stronger as we exercise, depending upon the type of exercise you do. So endurance training, of course, aerobic training and things like that, running, biking, swimming, you know, whatever you do, improves aerobic capacity by about 20%, which is good. So that, that would increase your vital capacity and the lactate threshold by about 30%, so it would go up. Um, and remember, that's normally between 50 to 70% of your VO2 max. Resistance training specifically increases muscle size by increasing your number of muscle fibers, um, which we call hypertrophy. So essentially, when you do weight training, you do get a lot of testosterone that is released, which it's a steroid, so this is a non-polar signaling molecule, and it has to go to Um, anyway, um, non-polar signaling molecule, which means that it um, can pass through the phospholipid bilayer. So it'd go through the membrane, go to the nucleus. It would trigger testosterone production, or I'm sorry, it would, it, it would trigger actin and myosin production in the skeletal muscle cell. And so you increase your actin and myosin, you increase your, your um, sarcomeres, so ultimately, the cell is going to get larger. It's going to hypertrophy. And once it gets to a certain size, it will divide into two. And so you get more muscle fibers as you weight train. With aerobic conditioning, you don't, you'll have some of that, but not as much as with weight training. Actually, has anybody used the 555 Strong Lift program? I think it's 555. Did you use that? Um, that's a pretty good program, although I do think, I mean, the whole idea, and this is actually, I think, important. I, I think weight training is important for everybody, like, at, at any age, because it is true that once you get 30, you start to lose your muscle fibers, and it only becomes harder to get them back, so if you have more fibers, to lose, then you basically can keep yourself stronger for longer, right? So as you age, obviously, things change. I mean, we're talking about people when they get in their 70s, 80s, and things like that. I mean, people, they can, they can start to lose strength very significantly. And that affects their gait, their balance, stability, all of that stuff. So it is important, I think, especially you know when you're younger, to do it. I mean, it's I know a lot of people do it for vanity, but it is very important to do it really for your health and for your future. And um, I remember once um, what I did. I I, I had um, decided I wanted to lose some weight, so I lost some weight, and I ended up when I lost the weight. I became like so incredibly like I looked and I'm like I hardly had any muscle. Like there wasn't any muscle. I didn't know what you know, I was like, you know, like my my whole my whole body was just fat, I guess. No, I I I was never like real heavy, but it was just I I felt like I, I wanted to lose some weight. So I don't know, I lost maybe eight pounds or nine pounds or something like that. But what I lost was all that. And so then I started to do to do weight training, and I did use the five by five strong lifts program. It was a really nice program because it, like, you, you basically do five times of a particular weight, and then you like increase like after a certain amount of time, and then you do like five, and so you're perpetually like increasing your weight. Although I do think that there is a limitation <laughs> to how much weight you can actually. Um, Bodies in handball, and sometimes I watch those videos. I can't watch those videos of people when they like their, oh, their bones break and stuff. I mean, 
I don't know. There's only so much. I think there's only so much. But the whole idea is, is gaining more muscle is good for you. It's very, very good for you. So that's, that's, um, that is for uh, resistance training. Endurance training, on the other hand, has other types of effects. And again, I think a mixture of both types of training is good. I, you know, I don't necessarily think just weightlifting is good or just aerobic training is good. I think both have their benefits. So for this, this is a really nice table that summarizes a lot of the um, benefits of endurance training. We have, uh, first of all, an improved ability to obtain ATP from oxidative methods, so aerobic cellular respiration. Why? Because the cells increase their mitochondria numbers and the size of the mitochondria, which means that we're going to have less lactic acid produced given um, you know, a particular amount of exercise, which makes sense because we have a much more efficient way to make our energy aerobic. And also what helps us to make things aerobically or energy aerobically is that we have an increase in myoglobin contents and an increase in intramuscular triglyceride content. We know that most cells prefer fatty acids for their energy requirements. We saw that at the end of the metabolism chapter. We also have an increase in, the protein, in a, um, an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase which is an enzyme that's needed to utilize lipids from the blood. And we have a lot more energy derived from fat and less from carbohydrates. If you have two people who are the same weight, same age, sitting side by side, one person is muscular, they weigh the same amount. One person is muscular, the other person is not. The person who is muscular will burn more energy sitting for the same amount of time as the person who doesn't have a muscle because skeletal muscles always have need their input of ATP and even sitting still not using the muscles that much just you know taking notes or twitching your foot or whatever you're going to be using more um, fatty acids from the bloodstream than you would if you didn't have that muscle tissue there. Um, and then we have a lower rate of glycogen depletion during exercise. Why? Because we can make our energy so efficiently through aerobic capacity. We also have um, an improved efficiency in extracting oxygen from the blood because again, we have more mitochondria and so forth. And this is the interesting one too, I think, is that you have a decreased number of type 2X fibers. They basically convert to type 2A fibers. So those, of course, are generating um, power generating fibers, but they don't fatigue as quickly because of the properties that we talked about. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so cardiac and smooth muscles. Um, there's really not much to talk about in terms of cardiac muscle contraction because we've already covered it. Cardiac muscle tissue and skeletal muscle tissue both have cell telomeres. They're both striated. They both have actin and myosin in the same way. So the contraction mechanism is really pretty much the same as what we described. Um, but cardiac muscle cells, of course, are shorter and they're branched and they're connected to one another through these um, intercalated discs, which have gap junctions associated with them. So basically, the cardiac muscle cells can communicate very rapidly with each other, and they can all contract and relax at the same time, you know, as a unit. Smooth muscle, on the other hand, is smooth because it does not contain striations. It does not contain actin and myosin. It does not have sarcomeres. What smooth muscle has, um, it does, well, I shouldn't say, it doesn't have the sarcomere, but it does have actin and myosin. But it's arranged in a different way. In fact, smooth muscle has more actin than it has myosin, which allows greater stretching and contracting. Actin filaments are anchored to what are called dense bodies. Um, and basically, they're arranged sort of in this, almost like a net-like, arrangement it sort of looks like a diamond here but it 
what happens is, is when the actin is pulled over the myosin, it's going to cause these diamonds to kind of shorten and it will cause the muscle to thicken up in the middle. Um, kind of like if you were squeezing a balloon with a pair of fishnet stockings, something like that is basically how I would describe it. You're looking a little confused. Maybe you're like, well, maybe you're okay. All right. So how, how, how the smooth muscle contract? I'm going to skip this slide because it's narrative of what I'm going to show you. You can read those slides to describe what's happening here, but I just want to use the diagram. Um, what's happening is, is just like, you know, any muscle or any kind of excitable cell, we basically have EPSPs that occur that get us to a threshold level and an action potential is generated. When this happens, just like with skeletal muscle, we get calcium channels that open. But here, calcium doesn't bind with troponin or anything like that. It has a different role. What it does, it binds to something cal called calmodulin. So you get a calcium calmodulin complex, which is going to activate something called the myosin light chain kinase. How it does this is it um, basically, so you remember what a kinase is, right? We just mentioned. Remember over here, we talked about creatine phosphokinase. What does it do? It transfers a phosphate to ADP. Kinase enzymes give phosphates to things. So when calcium calmodulin activates MLCK, or the myosin light chain kinase enzyme, what happens is, is that that enzyme gives a phosphate to something called the myosin light chain. When phosphate's given to myosin light chain, we get what's called cross bridge activation and contraction. And that cross bridge formation and contraction dynamic lasts as long as it needs to. For example, think about it. When I'm standing here, what if like the smooth muscle in my blood vessels got tired? and it just decided I'm done contracting, I'm gonna like just relax now. I would fall down because my blood pressure would drop, right? I need constriction in my blood vessels in order to keep the blood pressure up so that the blood can go to my head and so forth. So smooth muscle can contract and stay contracted for a very long time. However, it is muscle and it has a tone, just like any muscle tone. You know, any, any type of muscle we have. So sometimes like if a person is off their feet for a long time, like after surgery or something like that, they can develop an orthostatic hypotension because the smooth muscle tissue loses its tone. And so it takes a little bit of time to get it back. You know, you have to be on your feet, standing vertically, and it kind of retrains that smooth muscle. When it's time for the smooth muscle cell to stop contracting, when it's time for it to relax, there is another enzyme called myosin phosphatase. And if you remember phosphatase enzymes, they remove phosphates, right? Like glucose 6 phosphatase that we talked about took away the phosphate from glucose. Myosin phosphatase takes away the phosphate from the myosin light chain. The myosin light chain then relaxes and the smooth muscle relaxes. And that's basically it. It's actually not, not too complicated. Calcium combined with calmodulin, which activates MLCK, myosin light chain kinase, causing it to transfer phosphate to the myosin light chain, and that causes the contraction. When it's time to stop the contraction, myosin phosphatase is going to remove the phosphate, and um, when that happens, the myosin light chain relaxes and contraction ceases. That's it. Cool. So, any questions about that? Okay. Well, I'd like to talk about the heart, but it's 11.13. didn't post anything. I'd have to go post it. And if we took a break now, it seems like it would be too late. <laughs> right? Yes. Cut. You're out of time. Well, we're done. We're done forever. <laughs> you sound so upset. You sound so disappointed.
All right, I guess I'll let you go. Um, but if you want to, like, review anything for the test, like the test or something, if you have any questions for your lab test coming up there, let me know. Um, right now, you have.